Namaste and greetings. I, Ishika Chaudhary, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evamiti, Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Dilli, extend my warm welcome to you all to IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered for a panel discussion on the topic, Gendering Vulnerability Research in the Peri-Urban as a part of the series, The State of Cities, Hashtag City Conversations by IMPRI. As moderator, we have Dr. Somardeep Chattopadhyay. He is Associate Professor at Vishwabharti Shanti Niketan and also a visiting senior fellow at IMPRI New Delhi. We welcome you, sir. As speaker, we have Professor Vishal Narain. He is Professor at Management Development Institute, MDI Gurgaon. We welcome you, sir. As discussants, we have Dr. Ramakrishna Nalathigga. He is Associate Professor at National Institute of Construction Management and Research, Pune. We welcome you, sir. Dr. Divya Gupta, she is Senior Research Fellow at Bharti Institute of Public Policy, Indian School of Business, ISP Hyderabad. We welcome you, ma'am. Dr. Minakshi Sinha, she is a postdoctoral fellow at Applied Social Sciences, Banaras Hindu University, BHU, Varanasi. We welcome you, ma'am. Samir Unhale, he is Joint Commissioner at Directorate of Municipal Administration in Government of Maharashtra. We welcome you, sir. And Dr. Chinya Mukherjee, she is Assistant Professor at Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Kharagpur. We welcome you, ma'am. We all look forward to learning from the esteemed gathering. Now I hand over the proceedings to Dr. Somyadeep Chattopadhyay, sir. Thank you. So thank you, Ishika, and good evening and namaskar to all of you. Uh, on behalf of uh, the Center for Habitat, Urban and Regional Studies at IMPRI, I once again welcome you all to this uh, City Conversation series. Uh, we started this series in uh, 2019 uh, with the aim of uh, deliberating on the disparate uh, problems of cities in developing countries and of course with some emphasis, more emphasis on the Indian cities and how to make them more uh, livable, equitable and sustainable. And uh, focus of today's conversation as it is quite evident from the title is on peri-urban areas. And broadly, uh, these areas are of the fringe areas of the cities or, or the adjoining rural areas and these are closely linked with the city economy. Inhabitants of these uh, petty urban regions are increasingly threatened uh, by a deteriorating quality of life and uncontrolled growth at the periphery of the cities is occurring. Uh, the other set of problems uh, pertain to the non-availability of infrastructure and basic services. And India is urbanizing, that is a fact. And so the concern is growing over uh, these adverse conditions created by such uncontrolled growth and and unregulated development in the petty urban areas. And also there is official neglect and non-recognition of these areas in assigning urban civic status, are creating a serious governance deficit and alert to the vulnerabilities of these areas. Now to understand these vulnerabilities and other related aspects in the petty urban areas, uh, we are fortunate to be joined by a group of eminent urban scholars and practitioners. Uh, today, uh, we will be hearing from uh, Professor Bishal Narayan, who is a Professor of Public Policy and Governance at the Management Development Institute, Gurgaon. And his broad research interests include uh, interdisciplinary analysis of public policy processes and institutions, water governance, vulnerability and adaptation to the environmental change, as well as uh, the peri-urban issues. And he, has, he was awarded with the prestigious RS, uh, SRSN Prize by the Indian Society of Agricultural Economics uh, for the book titled Institution, Technology and Water Control, Water User Associations and Irrigation Management Reformed in Two Large Scale System in India. And on a personal note, uh, uh, I uh, just uh, find this book uh, very much useful while doing some study on water user association in West Bengal. And he's also the author of a Public Policy, A View from the South, which is published by Cambridge University Press. And apart from these books, he has authored quite a number of research papers in uh, top ranked journals like land use policy, geoforum, climate policy, water international, and so on. And also, he has been a consultant to several organizations, including uh, FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, IWMI, the International Water Management Institute 
of Colombo, the Asia Foundation, New Delhi, and Sassy Water at Hyderabad, uh, India. And also today, as Isika has already mentioned, that we have a discussion, Dr. Ramakrishna Lathiga, uh, Dr. Divya Gipta, Dr. Minakshi Sina, and Dr. Jenia Mukherjee. And also we will be joined by Mr. Samir Unhale. So uh, we have a, a terrific panel of both urban uh, practitioners and the urban scholars. And today, uh, as the topic is the general vulnerability research in the peri-urban area. So with these uh, few words, let me uh, hand over uh, this virtual floor to uh, Professor Narayan for your uh, talk. So it's over to you, uh, Professor Narayan. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chattopadhyay, for the introduction. And thanks to, uh, to MP for the opportunity. Very nice to be here to connect with a lot of people uh, I've heard about uh, and some of his work I've read, but never interacted with uh, in person or virtually. So just give me a moment to share my screen. Can you see it? Can you see the full screen? Okay. Yes. So, so, so yeah. So, I titled my talk uh, "Fluid Relations: Gendering Vulnerability Research in the Peri-Urban." And what I really want to draw attention to is the changing nature of gender relations in peri-urban context. And uh, most of my research is around, uh, you know, peri-urban water security issues, and that's where I'm coming from. And so, uh, my title actually has uh, two meanings. It's fluid because it refers to water. And it's also fluid, fluidity in a relationship. So I'm trying to argue that gender relations are, are not static, they are transformed. And the peri-urban context provides a very fertile ground to understand uh, transforming gender relations. So that's how, uh, that's how I've uh, you know, kept the focus of my talk. So just to give you an overtalk of how the talk, an overview of how the talk is structured. So I'll talk a little bit about contextualizing the peri-urban. And partly that's because uh, the word peri-urban uh, is used in different ways by different uh, practitioners, by different scholars. And uh, many of us may have a different frame of reference when we talk about the peri-urban. So I would like to spend some time bringing everyone uh, to a common ground in terms of what I mean when I'm talking about the peri-urban. Uh, I would like to talk a little bit about the term vulnerability, which uh, has acquired a lot of prominence in the scholarly literature, especially in relation to the climate change discourse and spend a few minutes talking about uh, what makes vulnerability gendered. I mean, if you deconstruct the concept of vulnerability, you find that uh, you find in terms of exposure, adaptive capacity, uh, sensitivity, all these are gendered. Then spend a little bit, uh, talk a little bit about why gender in the peri-urban. Why should we talk, be talking about gender in the peri-urban? And interestingly, um, there is very little on gender in the peri-urban uh, in the scientific literature, even though uh, the peri-urban literature has grown quite significantly over the last few decades. Then I will draw upon my own research uh, in peri-urban Gurgaon and, peri and in Mukteshwar to talk about changing gender relations around natural resources. So what is it in the peri-urban environment? What is it in the peri-urban context that causes gender relations to be transformed? Uh, I'll conclude with some key propositions from my talk, some key inferences, and then some thoughts on the way forward, also hoping that some of the discussants may want to expand on my uh, concluding thoughts in terms of how we take forward uh, you know, the agenda of research, action, and capacity building uh, in, uh, in relation to the peri-urban. So, so peri-urban is a very loosely used term with a variety of connotations, and uh, each one of us may have a different frame of reference, even though Dr. Chattopadhyay spoke a little bit about the peri-urban in the beginning, saying that it's, 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 it's places at the periphery of the city, it's a rural area uh, being gradually engulfed by the city, which has characteristics of both the rural and the urban environment. And that's how uh, most of us have understood the peri-urban as, as, as a periphery of the city. And um, uh, writing on uh, uh, writing in the context of Southeast Asia, Mekki used the word Desakota. So Desa means uh, countryside and Kota means city. So Desakota would basically be a place that combined features both of the rural and the urban environment. Uh, in my recent work, I've argued that um, while place-based definitions are important and useful in terms of drawing the attention of policymakers and planners, uh, they will uh, they will gradually uh, lose 
uh, relevance in the context of the global south. And this is basically because of the nature of urban expansion, because of the way cities are growing. Um, and what we really have is, is a continuum where you know, the boundary of one city or town ends and that of another one starts. And, and therefore, uh, to think of uh, a peri-urban area as a kind of a geographically demarcated place will become extremely problematic. And moreover, if you look at how modern Indian cities like Bangalore, Chennai, Gurgaon, Noida have grown, uh, this coexistence of the rural and the urban can be found in the heart of the city and not necessarily at, it, at its periphery. So for instance, I live in a gated colony in Gurgaon. And as, as soon as I leave my colony, I'm into a, a rural settlement area. And from the uh, window, uh, from the balcony of my house, I can see a common land where uh, people from the neighboring villages still come to pick up fodder and fuel wood and, and graze their livestock. So what is this? Am I living in a rural area or an urban area? And that's why I want to argue is that this kind of a place-based definition of peri-urban uh, is gradually losing its relevance. And it's much more uh, appropriate to think of the peri-urban as a conceptual lens to talk about rural urban transformations as some kind of an analytical construct to look at uh, the changing nature of, uh, of, rural, of rural spaces as they're engulfed by the city, uh, as an analytic uh, construct to look at uh, the coexistence with rural and the urban and the changing flows of goods, services, and resources between rural and urban areas. Uh, vulnerability. So, of course, the word vulnerability has been used in many different disciplines. And uh, in recent decades, uh, it's caught our attention for many of us, uh, mainly in the context of the climate change discourse. And when we talk about vulnerability, we are referring to the susceptibility to harm. And what I find extremely uh, useful uh, and relevant as a way of conceptualizing vulnerability is this definition uh, which, which of IPCC 2007, which, which talks about vulnerability in terms of exposure, adaptive capacity, and sensitivity. Um, and uh, along with the words uh, resilience and adaptation, uh, the word vulnerability has, uh, has structured uh, how we think about the impacts of climate change, how we understand uh, the socially differentiated impacts of climate change. And uh, donors, uh, funders have invested huge sums of money uh, to, uh, in research and action research and vulnerability assessments uh, to support vulnerability reduction. So that's how, uh, that's how we engage with the word vulnerability. And I thought I would speak about it a little bit before getting on to the main subject of my talk. If we deconstruct vulnerability into its components of exposure, adaptive capacity, and sensitivity, we find that a vulnerability is gendered. Yeah, and so exposure is gendered because of the gender-based division of labor uh, at the household and in the fields, right? Uh, which determines uh, what kinds of activities men and women will be engaged with, what kinds of activities men and women uh, will be involved with, which in turn shapes their exposure to climatic events, to disasters, to all kinds of environmental change. Adaptive capacity is gendered because if you look at uh, the, the access to natural capital, social capital, human capital, financial capital, physical capital, which in large part shape uh, an individual or a household's adaptive capacity, we find that they are gendered because men and women have a differential access to all these forms of capital, whether it's land, water, forest, men and women have different ways in which they're integrated with social networks, right? Um, men and women have differential access to financial capital, to physical capital. And therefore, adaptive capacity is gendered. And I understand that sensitivity is gendered due to some combination of the above. So when we deconstruct the concept of vulnerability, we find that uh, that vulnerability to, uh, to climate change, vulnerability to climate-induced disasters, vulnerability to all forms of environmental change uh, is gendered. So a lot of studies show, and it's not surprising then, that women are more vulnerable to mortality from climate-induced and other disasters. And this often has to do uh, with the social norms. We say that gender is a social construct. Often it has to do with social norms that militate against women despite their physical and biological strength. Yes, uh, it may have to do with dressing codes. It may have to do with women's uh, weaker integration with early warning systems and with their caregiving responsibilities at home. So why are gender lens in the peri-urban? So, uh, as we understand that the, that the peri-urban is a space in transition and it has enormous social and economic heterogeneity. So normally we, 
uh, talk of the peri-urban as a place of extreme poverty, but I would say that it's not just poverty, it's, it's a place of glaring economic inequality because uh, we may have uh, the peri-urban elite, like the large farmers uh, who may prosper through the sales of land. On the other extreme, we may have migrants, tenants, sharecroppers who lose out opportunities to earn a living. Uh, we have people who depend on the commons for access to natural resources, but the commons are engulfed by real estate, the commons are engulfed by, or formally acquired uh, through state approaches for urban expansion. So it's a space in transition with a lot of social and economic heterogeneity. And when we look at gender, and when we look at why we want to talk about gender, I would say that gender is perhaps the most basic axis of social differentiation. So, uh, of course, it becomes meaningful in relation to other axes of social differentiation, and that's why we talk of intersectionality. Yeah, but in a space that's that's socially and economically very heterogeneous, gender as a most basic axis of social differentiation provides an extremely relevant and important conceptual entry point to understand inequalities in society. And, uh, and if you look at the kinds of processes taking place in the peri-urban in terms of land use change, migration, occupational diversification, uh, all these processes affect the gender-based division of labor, for example, to the feminization of agriculture, right? So these are some intuitive thoughts, but when you look at the, uh, the peri-urban literature, you find that many uh, many streams of thought have grown in recent years. So we know a lot about, uh, so there's growing literature on commons in the peri-urban, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's literature on, um, on poor access to infrastructure, on wastewater use in peri-urban agriculture, on health implications, uh, but we know relatively little about, uh, about changing gender relations in the peri-urban context. And that's really, uh, you know, uh, a, a sort of a gap that I want to address in the hope that it will stimulate other researchers also to, to pursue the line of inquiry. So in this larger context, so the main uh, question for this talk today is how do processes of urbanization affect gender relations around natural resources in the peri-urban? And what are the implications of this for how we problematize and talk about gender? So I would also like to start by saying that uh, when I started my research, I did not necessarily start explicitly with a gender focus. Right, uh, but uh, gender was so basic uh, to my research that it always came up, and to me that's also one of the strengths of taking an empirical inductive approach, uh, where you you remain open to, uh, to 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 observations in the field as they emerge, and then you draw your inferences from them. So I will talk uh, using that ethnographic uh, using that empirical inductive approach based on ethnographic field work uh, in peri-urban Gurgaon in India and in Mukteshwar. So uh, my talk uh, builds upon my field work in Budhera and Sultanpur, two villages in peri-urban Gurgaon in Northwest India, and uh, in Mukteshwar in the Kumaon Hills of North India. And I want to argue that the transformation in gender relations in the peri-urban interface happens in three ways. So the first way in which that happens is through the occupational diversification and the migration of men. Now, you know, we, um, we have this assumption uh, that uh, when we talk about gender and water, we assume that it's women who collect water. And we have, you know, uh, reports of donors, funders, um, you know, uh, that work on water with a cover page showing women carrying pots of water on their heads. But when I was doing uh, my field work in Sultanpur village, about uh, 15 to 20 kilometers from something to Gurgaon, I found that uh, in the upper caste, in the Rajput families, women did not go out to collect water. It was considered to be against their mariada. That's the word that they use, against norms of social dignity, right? <clears throat> However, with land use change yeah, in the peri-urban space, um, men started moving out to the city on a daily basis to work. So they had not necessarily migrated, but they would do up and they would move to and fro to the city. And then women would, did not wait for them to come home to get water. And then even women in the Rajput families and the upper caste families uh, started going out to collect water. And what they said in the field, and I quote is Parda Patkya, means that the vial has been removed, right? So this, this is one way in which uh, in which through, uh, through occupational diversification, through land use change, gender relations around water were changing. So women uh, who were otherwise, who 
who otherwise did not venture out to collect water, now started going out to, to collect water. So this was one way through occupational diversification and the migration of men. The second way is through the impacts of the expansion of urban infrastructure. Now, one of the ways that we uh, talk about the peri-urban space is that, uh, is that it bears the ecological footprint of urban expansion. So, uh, so when I was doing uh, fieldwork uh, in Budhera, uh, yeah, uh, in, in peri-urban Gurgaon, so initially uh, there was one water treatment plant uh, that was called the Basay water treatment plant that basically met the needs of the city of Gurgaon. But then as the uh, population expanded, there was a need was felt through for the expansion of urban infrastructure. So a second water treatment plant had to be built. And uh, we often read about the, the Chandu Budhira water treatment plant in the newspaper. And so uh, when this water treatment plant was built, so the grazing lands of the village were acquired. Yeah, and this is uh, sort of, if you look at it from an equity lens, it's in a way paradoxical because Budhira was a highly livestock dependent village. And when this happened, households who wanted, who needed to maintain their livestock population switched from grazing to stall feeding. Now, in this part of the country, the uh, task of taking the livestock out to graze is a responsibility of men, but collecting fodder and bringing it home is a responsibility of women. So while in Budhira, the task of taking the livestock out to graze uh, was done uh, by men or by professional herders, when households switched to stall feeding, fodder had to be collected and brought home, and that was a responsibility of women. So this was one more way in which uh, women's responsibilities around, uh, around livestock and fodder collection increased. Now, to an outsider, this may not hit as something very obvious because all that you're doing is you're building a water treatment plant, uh, which seems to be, uh, seems to be a, a, an implicit or a natural response to meeting the water requirements of a growing city. But, but the way the ecological footprint is, is born, the way the ecological footprint is, is experienced is something uh, you know, that, that catches the attention of those who would look at uh, these kinds of implications from an equity lens, from a gender lens. So this basically uh, represents a case of gender, changing gender relations around livestock and fodder collection. And um, in a way, it shows how the ecological footprint of urbanization is disproportionately borne by women. And I'd like to mention here that it was uh, lower caste women who were, uh, you know, who, who bore the impacts much more because uh, in higher caste families, you have the option of growing fodder on your field on private lands, yes? So that's why I'm saying that the impacts are more acute for lower caste women who were dependent on the grazing lands. Now, we know from a number of studies, and Enes Joda was, was one of the pioneers of those studies, which showed that uh, it's, it's, it's the poor households, the small farmers, the landless households that depend much more on the commons. So wherever the commons uh, will be acquired for urban expansion, there will be uh, implications for, for, for poor farmers, for small farmers, for landless households. And they, whenever land use change happens, there are gendered implications, which is what I'm trying to draw attention to here. So this is the second way it happens through the impact of the expansion of urban infrastructure. The, yeah, the third way this happens is through the intersection of the forces of land use change and climate change. And here I'm drawing on my uh, research in Mukteshwar. Uh, many of us uh, who come from the north would know that it's uh, it's a beautiful place. Um, it's it, it's a scenic location, uh, and many people like to go there uh, for for vacation, um, as against the neighboring places of Nanital, Almora, which are much more crowded and commercialized. But when I did this field work, Mukteshwar was still pristine, relatively unspoiled. But uh, a lot of land use change was happening there to build uh, tourist resorts and. Uh, to build weekend getaways of the urban elite. And the lands that were the first to be acquired were the prime lands which were located uh, adjacent to springs. And when this land use change happened, local communities uh, lost access to springs that had historically been managed by them as commons. At the same time, increased competition uh, by tourist resorts, by elitist cottages for groundwater also reduced the availability of water in springs. Mm -hmm. And um, so on the one hand, there were these kind of land use changes, uh, increasing competition for water, also reducing the access of local communities to the springs. At the same time, 
And these effects were compounded by increased climatic variability and change. So local narratives pointed to reduced snow melt and rainfall, uh, which reduced the recharge in spring. So there was, uh, uh, so there was again, increased drudgery in accessing water. And at the same time, there was also increased drudgery in fodder collection with land use change. And what had happened here was that, uh, that households had switched from grains to fruits and vegetable cultivation, partly in response to meet the demands of the market, but also in response to changing climatic patterns. And uh, so when you go grow grains, the harvest residue is available to you as a source of fodder. And, but with the switch from grains to fruits and vegetables, that option was no longer available. And coupled with the colonizing of reserve forest, it again um, you know, made access to, uh, to fodder much more difficult, right? And so what we found was that women adapted by mobilizing social capital. So for instance, there was norms of reciprocity in fodder collection. So women, so neighboring women would help each other in, in meeting the requirements of fodder for the respective households. But they also responded by, for instance, walking one way to collect fodder and returning in a shared taxi. But uh, we also found that men and women responded differently to questions on climate change. So when we asked men about climate change, they would have a lot of explanations about why it was happening, what was causing it. When we asked women, they said, Mujhe kya pata? Like, how, what do I know? And we inferred that women were busy adapting uh, to, their know, to their new roles. They didn't have so much time to engage with what was going on or to articulate it, they didn't have space to articulate it. But, but they knew that they had to quickly keep responding to uh, to, uh, to, you know, to their task of meeting uh, the requirements for fuel, wood, water, and water at home. So these are three ways in which uh, I've drawn on my research to show, uh, to show how gender relations are changing in the, in the peri-urban context. So what are the broader influences and propositions? So of course, urbanization land use change intersect with increased climatic variability and change to alter gender relations around natural resources. And this often translates into increased work burdens for women in the fields and at home. Also, uh, what I learned uh, is, that, uh, is that, of course, gender relations are highly contextual and, uh, and need to be studied on a blank slate. So it doesn't help to go to the field with pre preconceived notions of who does what. Yes, uh, intersectionality is important. So for a meaningful analysis of gender, we need to look at how it intersects with other acts of social differentiation like caste. So both in Sultanpur and Budhera, uh, lower caste women uh, faced, the, faced, the, faced the highest level of drudgery, the highest level of discrimination in accessing water. And in both the villages, we had found that when, uh, you know, when a higher caste, when a lower caste woman was filling water from a public stand post and she would leave, and the upper caste woman would come, and she would first wash the stand post uh, uh, as if it had been made impure by the use of lower caste women. So looking at gender makes sense when you look at it through a lens of intersectionality, looking at it through its intersection with other axes of social differentiation. And as I said, my talk was, was titled Gender Relations are Fluid. And as researchers, we must investigate this fluidity. We, we must uh, try to look at what is it in the very urban context that is causing a gender relations to change? What is it? And that's causing gender relations to get transformed with implications for differential vulnerability of men and women to, uh, to urbanization, to land use change, whose effects get coupled with increased climatic change and variability. So I hope I'm still within my time. Yes, uh, yeah. And I will just leave with some concluding thoughts. So uh, I want to, uh, well, say that gender relations that very urban constitute a fertile area for further research and inquiry. So. Um, there's possibly much more to be unraveled here, much more to be explored here. And uh, they need more attention and research, policy and capacity building, and perhaps the discussants may also want to reflect on uh, what might be ways of moving forward on this. And I think that this need has become much more stronger after the pandemic, because um, uh, very urban spaces, uh, because of their very close links with urban areas, uh, you know, looking at how the pandemic has disrupted rural urban mobility, uh, looking at the uh, enormous presence of the informal sector, uh, you know, in, in peri-urban spaces. I think that there's much more to be explored here in terms of gender relations, even though the pandemic makes it much more difficult to continue to engage with communities 
to you know to do what we call a co-creation of knowledge. Yes, and uh, so that that's an important challenge to, to address. I think uh, how do we continue to create knowledge on the periurban after the after the pandemic when our opportunities to do field work uh, to immerse in the context are uh, extremely limited now. Um, I also think that uh, I that intervening in the period requires much more collaboration across um, across academics, researchers, NGOs, and the state. And while uh, formal state uh, planning approaches are necessary, I don't think that they are sufficient. So the assumption that if a periurban area would get reclassified as a city. Uh, you know, uh, its governance problems will be tackled like a magic wand or like a quick fix. To me, is a strong assumption uh, because it's a very messy space, uh, a lot of um, uh, a biodiversity of actors, uh, a very strong presence of non-statutory mechanisms of resource allocation, uh, which need to be understood. So I think that we need more action research, uh, more collaboration uh, between the state uh, local governments, researchers, um, uh, and NGOs. And also, I think more men should study and talk about gender. So gender is not just about women. It's about uh, the, you know, the differences between men and women. And uh, I often find myself um, on a gender panel where I happen to be the only man. And luckily, that's not the case today. So I was very happy to see a good gender balance uh, in the composition of the uh, so if you, if, you, if you look at the the speaker, the moderator, and the uh, discussions together, there was a very good gender balance. So, so to me, that was a very heartening. Uh, that was very heartening to note because otherwise, I'm very often the only man talking about gender in an all women panel. So I think that more men should talk about gender, uh, because if you want gender transformative change, then both men and women have to be part of it, and not just women. Uh, doing advocacy for, for protecting women's rights. So on that note, I would stop. And uh, thank you for the opportunity and uh, hand you over back to uh, to the chair, to Dr. Chattopadhyay. So thank you, Professor Narayan, for an exciting talk. It's really wonderful to hear from you. So uh, there are very many important takeaways from your talk. First, uh, quite rightly, because those who are not very much familiar with this very idea of uh, these peri-urban areas, you have rightly uh, problematized the very definition of uh, these peri-urban areas as a geographical, uh, rather than a geographical place of demarcated areas, rather you define it as a place for transition. And also you uh, wonderfully deconstructed have uh, this very concept of vulnerability and its uh, gendered nature in terms of, uh, you mentioned about the uh, division of labor, then uh, the adaptive capacity in terms of differential access to natural and financial resources, uh, the sensitivity, and then also you argued about the how the changes in these land use pattern, this migration, occupational di diversification, all have uh, some gender implications in the peri-urban areas. And what I find it very interesting is this example of uh, uh, where you have shown that how this appropriation of common uh, for the expansion of the uh, uh, this urban infrastructure has some very interesting gender implication and which has also intersected uh, with the caste issues. So these are very interesting topic. And uh, also you mentioned about the higher inclination among the women for adapting to the climate change. All these have, having some uh, greater implications for the, uh, uh, the gender-related research on the peri-urban area. So it's a wonderful talk and I'm sure that uh, many of our uh, discussions will shed some more lights uh, into this uh, topic. So, uh, uh, so now uh, let me open this floor for our discussion. So uh, uh, let, uh, let us start with uh, uh, Dr. Ramakrishna uh, uh, Narathiga, who is an associate professor at the National Institute of Construction, Management and Research, Pune. Uh, so it's over to you, uh, Dr. Narathiga. Yeah, first of all, uh... Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, so first of all, thanks for this opportunity to interact. Uh, I know I read uh, Professor Narayan's articles, particularly in the context of uh, water resources, uh, in the context of Hyderabad, where he has collaborated and worked with in the context of Anjal Prakash about how uh, the, uh, the, the various uh, processes are leading to, uh, in, in the peripheral areas of Hyderabad and few other cities are leading to uh, the resource issues, be it groundwater or even surface water in terms of the lake water 
uh, access uh, issues which were emerging. But uh, of course, gender is not a uh, my area of uh, interest or research as such. But uh, I would like to bring about uh, some uh, kind of uh, precursors to uh, perhaps uh, gender uh, in the form of one way we think about uh, uh, looking in a positive or progressive way about the gender is that like to how do we mainstream the gender into the formal planning processes. So one thing is that like uh, that's where the, the uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, thinking about the in the from the planning circles we are I'm talking about the urban planning and the spatial planning uh, people uh, who say that like much of this uh, kind of uh, peri urban areas or peri urban growth and peri urban development is happening uh, in the fringe areas is because of the shortcomings on the on the part of the planning system which is not properly understood particularly in the developing countries context particularly uh, uh, our uh, planning apparatus which is built upon the uh, the colonial planning apparatus which have not really innovated uh, uh, much is giving rise to a wide disparity in the way in which the plans are made and the reality is essentially our plans are very very uh, incremental in nature and uh, the kind of standards we set when it comes to the planning are also very, very impractical that are not even uh, that are perhaps appropriate for the developing developed countries, but not for the developing countries. In fact, in some of the standards, actually, we, our standards are uh, even much more than the developed country standards. For example, the water supply uh, is a very good example. So whether the planning itself is a kind of uh, a failure in, in, in that uh, as, 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 a, as an institution is one thing which uh, comes to my mind. And second is that like whether the planning, uh, even if it were able to uh, take care of by its processes to deliver the services as well as uh, the, the uh, develop the formal spaces, uh, still what happens is that like because, uh, most of the planning confines to the formal city and uh, beyond the formal city, which is the declared urban, uh, it really doesn't go beyond planning. Whereas that is where actually you need the planning. So our planners are perhaps uh, should have been uh, looking not only to the core area, but rather to the, should have been planning more on the peripheries. But we see that like more and more resources and planning efforts are made to the central cities, which already have resources and plans and therefore, the gendering is already taking place in those areas, whereas peripheral areas are the places where the planning is a failure and planning is not done. And uh, one of the reasons, one of the ways in some of the countries have taken care is by the way of the regional plans, like in the UK. So which try to address uh, the concerns which are not addressed by the planning in the city boundaries by the way of some kind of regional plans so that like these will accommodate the services, uh, the spaces and a formal development processes to be put in place, which is somewhat absent in our country other than few cities like uh, Mumbai and uh, uh, to some extent Delhi. Uh, very few cities have got any kind of regional plans or plans, uh, planning bodies as such. So that is one lacuna in, 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 in our planning system. And uh, the other is that like uh, uh, criticism that comes about the planning institutions is that like, even if they are there, there is a, uh, the, the institutional capacity is sometimes poor in the sense that like the, the, the amount of staff, be it staffing related, or even te the technical capacities of the staff itself is somewhat limited. And again, it is most of the time, it is state government led planning rather than the planning done by the regions or the cities in the peripheral areas as such. So that is, uh, uh, all this is compounding into, uh, the, uh, into the manifestation of this kind of uh, peripheral areas, which are not, uh, which are deprived of the kind of, you know, the planned developed spaces and uh, planned uh, civic services and, uh, uh, and therefore, along with that, when, once these are in place, uh, the assumption, of course, it not to be uh, valid is that like, you know, 
the, the, the development, uh, the economic development processes will start working and uh, the, the, the gendering or mainstreaming of the gender can happen. Uh, so that's where I thought I'll just would like to uh, bring an attention to this. And if it is uh, uh, this kind of shortcoming, which is there in the uh, planning and service delivery, uh, what are the views on like overcoming them, some of them, or uh, what are your views on that as such? I thought. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nalathiga, for uh, uh, drawing our attention to this. Uh, problem of uh, uh, lack of planning or uh, uh, broadly I can say it that governance deficits uh, which uh, having uh, uh, which ultimately shapes this uh, the in access to infrastructure and I'm sure that uh, Professor Narayan has already mentioned about uh, the gendered uh, access uh, to the differential access to the infrastructural services uh, in the different uh, study areas. So definitely, uh, these are very important issues, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Narayan will be touching upon all, all these issues uh, uh, while in responding to your uh, comments. Uh, now, let me uh, move over to uh, Dr. Divya Gupta, who is a senior research fellow at uh, Varti Institute of Public Policy at the Indian School of Business. So it's over to you, Dr. Divya. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Dr. Narayan, for such an enlightening talk. And uh, thank you, Dr. Chattavadhyay, for organizing and moderating. I honestly have been learning so much through these interactions. Uh, for, all these, for all these years, I've worked mostly in the rural context. And uh, through my experience of working in the rural context in, in India and now also in Nepal, uh, what I'm uh, starting to become more curious about is this peri-urban space because you know, there is, as Dr. Narayan mentioned, uh, these urban areas are expanding and they're expanding into the rural space. And there's this really interesting space of peri-urban areas that are, uh, that are uh, also expanding. So initially the, the boundaries got fuzzy and then now uh, the, those areas are, are becoming, you know, wider. And, uh, and there are a lot of interesting interactions that are happening in those transitioning spaces. And I've been thinking about this, and and uh, and it's it's really uh, uh, you know the the uh, the talk happened in a very timely manner because currently uh, Dr. Narayan I'm working in Kangra in Himachal, and in this research I'm mostly looking at the impact of people's interaction or the dependence on the forest at the time of the pandemic, and now Kangra is really interesting because uh, you know it's. Uh, uh, the, the region where we are working, especially our sites very close to Dharamshala and McClure Ganj. And, you know, you can't compare them to these traditional cities like Bombay and Delhi and Bangalore, but they are, they have over time, like, you know, these areas, Dharamshala and McClure Ganj, because of the tourist attraction, they have expanded in the sense that there is, there are these like, you know, resorts. And, and this is something which is like very typical in, in a lot of, Northeastern um, uh, areas like Mukteshwar that you just mentioned, that although they are not like, you know, uh, they do not fit the, the, the definition of urban or, or the cities, yet there are these, uh, uh, these activities or infrastructure expansion that are happening. And unfortunately, these areas, they cannot accommodate that kind of like, you know, infrastructure expansion, yet they're happening. And then these, the expansion is spilling over onto like, you know, uh, other neighboring regions. So the area where I'm working, um, and uh, so this is my first time working in Kangra region. And the moment I enter Kangra uh, in Palampur, so a lot of our sites are uh, around Palampur area. What really strikes is these concrete structures. structures, structures, structures. In panchayats, I, I see that how, even like the lifestyles of people, they're changing. It's changing from those kacha houses, like you know, from the mud houses to like a you know, more concrete house. So I see that lifestyle also changing. So in that context, in that transitioning context, I'm trying to understand how people's interaction with the forest changed at the time of pandemic. And what has been really interesting, I'm still at the very preliminary stage. And what has been really interesting for me is to see that we've conducted over uh, you know, 150 interviews so far. And across the board, people have mentioned that how their dependence has decreased or the dependence went down, especially at the time of the lockdown. And when we were thinking about as to like, you know, what could be the reason? And then keeping the context in mind, 
one of the things uh, that uh, that I've been thinking about, and I still have to validate, and you know, uh, as a panel, like you know, we can all reflect on it. So one of the the ideas that I've been thinking about is that the shock of the pandemic, I and mean, people had been in this process of transitioning, but the shock of the pandemic, uh, uh, it it pushed them further to take that call that you know we have to do something to secure our livelihoods. And, and it's kind of like you know uh, pushing them away from the traditional like you know, rural lifestyles and the rural livelihoods and 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 this is again really interesting because you know there is this dominant paradigm of how the rural community should be and then they are like you know, dependent on the natural resources and things like that. But then when we use this lens of peri-urban area, it it creates a very unique uh, you know picture altogether, and I think that is something. I, I wouldn't call it novel. Uh, I mean, we all are aware of it. it. It exists out there. But I think somehow, like, you know, the attention, the scholarly attention especially, has not been given to this uh, a lot. And, and oftentimes, like, you know, um, we, we fall into that trap of, oh, yes, natural resource dependence has increased, and these are rural communities. And, and really, like, you know, the, the, this context, especially, uh, uh, you know, using the lens of petty urban and even the expansion and spilling over of the other uh, urban uh, expansion into or the infrastructure expansion to rural areas and how that impacts the people's uh, dependence on natural resources has been like really interesting so it's it's, it's amazing i wanted to uh, to mention that how timely the stock happened and and it resonated a lot with me what i hadn't been thinking about is this gender lens and i very uh, I, I very much agree like even in my research i'm seeing that Although yes, the lifestyles are changing and people are opting for more like you know urban lifestyles and kind of like you know, moving away from the uh, rural lifestyles, yet there is this really stark divide. Um, I mean, uh, there are like you know very impoverished communities or or households that are still struggling to have their ends meet, and and I think in the in the in the context of peri-urban area, it becomes even harder like the divide. That socioeconomic divide, it's like you know, it's more prominent. So, so clearly, like you know, I'm we are seeing that uh, the the impoverished communities, especially in the context of shock in the peri-urban areas, they are affected the most. But then this this aspect of gender, it makes it even more interesting because even within the impoverished communities, the gender are furthermore like you know, I feel like uh, uh, they they're more like vulnerable. And they need further, like you know, de deconstruction and, and further sort of like you know, uh, you know, it, we need to explore that more. But I was thinking that um, I don't want to uh, be hopeless, and and I want to still uh, find ways uh, if there are opportunities for for these marginalized and for these vulnerable communities. So so I'm actually like I'm, I I would pose it as a question in a form of a question to the panel that. Yes, you know, there are these like you know vulnerabilities and gender vulnerabilities in peri urban area, and these vulnerabilities get even worse or exacerbated in the context of shocks like the pandemic. But then I'm wondering if there are opportunities for resilience, if there are opportunities for further like you know um, uh, empowering these vulnerable communities, because again, like in the context of pandemic, what we are studying that yes, I mean it's unprecedented event and has like you know caused major disruption but then there are also some opportunities um and and i'm not trying to undermine the the disruption and the damage and the huge loss that has happened due to the pandemic but i'm also wondering I, i'm being as realistic as possible because you know hope is all that we have but what possibly can be the opportunities to enable uh, given the context, to enable uh, these these vulnerable communities, especially like the the women, to 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 bounce back from the shock. So thank you, thank you, Dr. Divya, for sharing your uh, thoughts. And just to add to it, because I was also thinking in the same way, like uh, since Dr. Narayan has already mentioned in his talk about uh, the role that the women take in occupational diversification and. Uh, and then our, on all these economic activities. Uh, so what about the impact of such gendered kind of practices on their empowerment? Because this is a very crucial issues in the context of peri-urban areas. And since they are now being more, more and more engaged in different forms of activities, 
uh, and uh, uh, there are different even even in, in the case of access to infrastructural services they are now taking the burden of uh, of all doing all these things so what about the impl uh, empowermental Im implications along with the uh, important point which you have already mentioned about the resilience so so i'm sure that uh, uh, dr naran will, will enlighten us on all these issues and uh, now let me proceed uh, to uh, dr minakshi sinha who is a postdoctoral fellow uh, of applied social sciences at benares hindu university so it's over to you dr minakshi Hi, just to mention, uh, I've joined in a private consultancy. I was at VHO a couple of few months back. Oh, okay, that's right. And I'm just getting another contract at IHS. Okay. Doesn't matter, it was just like a short while back, so I think that's the problem. Anyway, the professor Narayan, first of all, uh, thank you to you for this uh, very nice talk. And although I uh, work in the sphere of urban, urban planning, including peri-urban, but gender is one lens which I haven't taken a look. Uh, I have just few comments, and probably I think whatever you've said is just just add on to it. I won't say it to you. Uh, one uh, was you mentioned about the sites which you had taken into account. One was the, the Gurgaon, and the other was Mukteshwar. Uh, so Mukteshwar, when you brought up the land use changes and other aspects, how that changed the gender transform. Uh, Transitions between the gender space. Uh, I was just curious about a few things. Uh, if you could hear more about what happened in Gurgaon. See, I'm assuming I don't know familiar with the sites in Uttarakhand. Uh, Gurgaon is likely to be different from uh, the hilly areas of Kumaon for many reasons. See, this is the kind of zone. Uh, I I don't know how Uttarakhand would look like. I'm assuming it's some sort of hilly area. It's largely dependent. There is a lesser sort of industrial opportunities to both. So it's less, uh, it's less available to men. It's less available to women. And then we're uh, now again coming back to Delhi NCR. We'll have more occupational opportunities, kind of economic inequality happening. So how do all those factors play into this kind of work? What are the differences there? So that was one thing I think I would just urge. I mean, I think probably some other people also would want to work in this area further. And uh, the other thing I wanted, probably wanted to take you back to was urban infrastructure, which you've already mentioned. Uh, see, again, uh, in terms of see, the kind of spatial planning, transportation, all of that, housing communities, all of, and even uh, across classes, the interactions with infrastructure systems create, provide, uh, provide opportunities for mitigation as well as uh, sort of uh, take away certain opportunities. See, and how do these change during the pandemic? I'll, pandemic, uh, I'll just give you one example. So during the pandemic, see, probably in uh, Mukteshwar, I'm assuming a lot of women, uh, they're dependent on forest and for all those things. Those opportunities, I mean, are unlikely to be taken away by lockdown. Or maybe that, I don't know, how the restrictions are going to play out there. But see, women working in households and say, in communities, and especially the lower income groups, interacting with the higher income groups in the housing communities of Gurgaon, they will be employed as household uh, maids or whatever. I don't know how, in what capacity. Also, how they may must be interacting their heads. I mean, uh, the upper class communities here. So, and uh, this is the largely the section which is an informal sector. So, can some way? I mean, if we have the dynamic equations, like how did, did the, these things play out during the pandemic? Did the employers give them give them money, or there was any backup, or they, they have to diversify, or our infrastructure? The I mean. I'm, I'm sure during the pandemic, some sort of uh, restriction must be played on how they were commuting, public buses and all, all those things. I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking in terms of economics, what was going on. And if those are the threats which can be brought out or can be researched more, what can the public system or the government, can, where can we intervene to mitigate those challenges? So these are some of the questions which I had. And probably I'm just putting, putting you a bit further in this. But again, the lens was refreshing. Uh, there's nothing, I won't say it was there. I mean, whatever I'm saying, you're just adding on and probably taking it a bit, bit further, whatever you've already done. But anyway, very nice. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sina. In fact, uh, like you, I think most of us uh, are all in, uh, have a lot of lots of questions because uh, this gendered list is so unique in the context of peri urban areas. So, uh, yeah, you have rightly pointed out some two specific questions. So, I'm sure that uh, uh, Dr. Narayan will uh, respond to your uh, questions uh, uh, during, during his uh, responses. Uh, uh, well, so uh, after that, let me now move over to uh, uh, 
Dr. Jania Mukherjee, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Kharagpur. So uh, uh, may I now request uh, Dr. Jania to share her comments. It's over to you. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, sir. Uh, thank you, Pramudip, sir. And thank you, Impri, for uh, giving me this opportunity. Because I have to confess that I am a big admirer of uh, Vishal Naran sir's works. And uh, since the days of, uh, when I was actually doing my PhD, and also I came in touch with uh, Adriana Allen. And I think Adriana, uh, like, uh, uh, she's uh, like one of the, one of the maybe propounders of this uh, peri-urban or peri-urbanization. And honestly, like when I was working on the East Kolkata wetlands uh, 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 and uh, East Kolkata wetlands, you know, that time, like uh, some scientists and uh, even like in a media uh, projection, East Kolkata wetlands was like uh, a kind of designated or considered as a very urban wetlands. And there was a whole lot of human cry that, uh, that, that whether it is right to, you know, uh, to, to, uh, try to um, uh, delineate East Kolkata wetlands as very urban or not. Because the like, historians, for example, and I remember like one of my uh, professors, uh, Shudeshna Banerjee, and she has also one publication which came out in 2012 uh, in the South Asia Chronicle, and she showed that you know that that uh, when uh, and as experts or scholars are trying to uh, are trying to uh, designate these wetlands as you know, peripheral or peri-urban wetlands, so there is a larger politics in this. Because they don't want to, you know, consider uh, this as part of the, you know, larger uh, frontier or uh, geo uh, ecomorphological dynamics of of the delta. So, like, very interesting, you know, uh, like discussions and uh, criticisms, debates, dialogue uh, going on that time. And then, like, I, I think for ten to twelve years, I had spent thinking about whether this EKW should be uh, considered peri-urban or not. And then finally, I uh, tried to tackle it uh, uh, in my book. So I think, uh, and and uh, Naran said definitely, uh, and, and also like uh, his uh, uh, articles with Sumit Bij. Uh, uh, so I think, I mean, they are wonderful articles, and uh, I felt all the time like I went uh, through those articles. They were extremely uh, like empirically also. They were very very rich. So and uh, today's presentation also like uh, I found very informative and uh, sir also mentioned about place based uh, why you know place based narratives and situatedness uh, they are uh, they provide importance you know uh, they, they can be considered as important perspectives or frames of analysis. So I think uh, my very small comment would be uh, because like uh, in urban political ecology uh, we already have this situated uh, urban political ecology now. So like, uh, you know, uh, very young scholars like Alex Fall Fallman or Natasha Konya or Annie Zimmer, you know, they, they, they are talking about uh, situatedness because I think all of us were quite provoked with uh, Lohan and Anstan's you know, provincializing uh, urban political ecology. So and, 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 and uh, in our own empirical context, we started talking about uh, you know, situatedness, why it is important to uh, basically con uh, uh, you know, concentrate on uh, micro political uh, specificities and uh, settings. And similarly, like, for example, uh, uh, Natasha and uh, Anna Zimmer, they edited this special uh, issue, uh, which came out in Samaj and, and um, uh, Yafa Chula. So Yafa has worked, uh, or Yafa is still working on Delhi and also, you know, uh, outskirts of Delhi. And Yafa, uh, very interestingly, she uh, talks about, you know, this intra space inequities. So uh, uh, it's not only, you know, the in, inter uh, spatial inequities, but it's also like intra spatial inequities. And she also, you know, uh, talks about, you know, uh, these intersections uh, uh, across caste, gender, uh, ethnicity, class. So why you know these intersections are uh, so very important? And I think you know this 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 topic it, it is still uh, uh, quite less focused. So for example, you know the, the empirical findings that uh, uh, Sir shared with us uh, in his presentation. So I think they are they are very uh, provocative in the sense that you know uh, like we are getting here everything together. And now, uh, you know, I was just repenting because I got the opportunity in 2015 to work with Adriana, where we were actually uh, looking into or we were mapping the water context in peri-urban uh, uh, Kolkata. 
So again, his Kolkata wetlands was part of the study, but other parts of Kolkata as well, other parts of peri urban Kolkata. And when we uh, talk, when we are uh, kind of mapping this water justice or injustice uh, situation, uh, we were kind of uh, documenting the array of bottom-up needs-driven practices or strategies uh, that are there or that which are pursued and practiced by uh, marginalized people uh, in those you know patches because there is uh, an uh, inadequacy in policy driven uh, initiatives but unfortunately we did not uh, 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 take gender um, as an important you know notion of analysis unfortunately but now you know after uh, listening to such lecture and also of course you know uh, uh, peri urbanization is something which is so so very important so i think uh, now this uh, talk, this presentation was uh, providing a whole lot of insights about why should we uh, include gender or accommodate gender into the discussion. And, and, and it can absolutely be juxtaposed, you know, into the dis discussion and, and I mean, a whole lot of fresh insights can get unfurled. Uh, so finally, also like um, another very interesting, uh, 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 like, um, study uh, so which one of my scholars is actually conducting as part of his phd so he is concentrating on the uh, solid waste management uh, mechanisms of practices in the small towns uh, in the periphery of kolkata so so this is this, this, this googly stretch like all these uh, like uh, colonial towns and it's, it's it's this stretch is also quite interesting because uh, this is called mini europe this, for example, Chandan Nagar was uh, colonized by uh, the French, then Sri Rampur by the Dutch. So we really have mini Europe uh, uh, there. So, uh, so he, uh, like coming from a quantitative background, so he uh, um, uh, uh, deployed what is known as IPA, Importance Performance Analysis. So it's a very typical method you know, of boring, of course, you know, people who don't like numbers a lot, uh, they will criticize uh, this uh, framework. But anyway, uh, but what he uh, would find out, it's, it's quite interesting that women, so when the scores, so now when uh, uh, he has been able to kind of release the scores, IP assessment, when the IP assessment has been complete, it's quite interesting to find out that women, they seem to be very active participants in terms of not only giving uh, due weightage or importance to various components of you know, solid uh, waste uh, management, but also performing uh, those up. And in the three like uh, small towns, uh, uh, which is a part of the study area, I mean, the performance of women uh, uh, is much better than their male counterparts. So now in his conclusion is, uh, trying to kind of uh, come up with policy recommendations that, and, and I think like this can be an interesting piece of study because it enables us to imagine women not only as passive spectators or uh, victims, but also coping actors and, and, and adaptive uh, managers and agents. So I think, uh, thank you very much, sir. And the last and final comment is, I just, I think I came across a, a, a report, small, a very small report uh, uh, in this, uh, like, uh, C, uh, but this is called uh, CGKN, Climate and Development Knowledge Network. So in their uh, platform, uh, I came uh, across a report where they actually talked about uh, uh, an environmental action group, I think Gorakhpur Environmental Action Group, uh, uh, who um, have, you know, who, uh, and its members of the Gorakhpur Environmental Action Group, they have worked with the local communities. And of course, gender, uh, they have given a whole lot of uh, weightage to this gender question. And because, you know, these local communities, many of them are also women. So there, is, there, there are like uh, opportunities or there are discussions now through which they are talking of like kind of climate compatible, gender sensitive forms of development. So my uh, question to Sarah is that, uh, would you like to also uh, share a bit of light on, you know, um, how can we mobilize or rather how academicians can get mobilized with this, uh, uh, you know, grassroots organizations or this action groups, because it, it is, I think, important for us to not only pursue transdisciplinary research, but also you know, how can we forge a transsectoral engagement? Because otherwise, you know, discussing gender uh, would not make much sense. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jenia, for your uh, very insightful comments. Now, 
I think uh, we have another discussion, Dr. Uh, Mr. Samir Unhale, but he's uh, not there. I'm not seeing him. Uh, so, uh, so let's move over to uh, Dr. Narayan for your responses, comments, observations to uh, yeah. the points which have our discussions raised. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, very overwhelming to see uh, you know so much interest on the on the periurban and also on gender. And uh, of course, I don't have uh, definitive answers to uh, all of the questions, but just uh, I, I mean, I could connect with most of the points that were raised because I also encountered them in my own work and my own research. And I'll just share some uh, some thoughts and uh, and reflection, and maybe then other panelists may also have further thoughts on them, and then we can get back to them. So starting with uh, Dr. Nelatiga, so. You know, the problem about planning and uh, how the peri-urban is the result of some kind of an unplanned uh, urban expansion and how there is a neglect at the periphery. So that is true. Um, uh, and that's the way the, you know, that's the way the peri-urban has been problematized, that it's a place, space of institutional neglect, that it's, um, it's a space of state apathy. And uh, so at the same time, uh, as I said, that to assume that uh, a formal planned approach, uh, for instance, by bringing them under some kind of a statutory uh, governance authority or body will solve the problems is also to my mind a strong assumption because it's a very messy space. It's not something that you can, from what I've understood, it's not something that you can directly intervene through a command and control mechanism or through a new kind of a, you know, planning body, which is not to say that that is not important. But I think that till that happens, uh, there's a lot of potential for getting, uh, say, people who live in such spaces into dialogue with the state. So uh, for instance, one of our projects, which was an action research project, we had organized uh, a series of uh, a series of uh, a series of meetings between uh, in Sultanpur village, which I spoke about, uh, a series of meetings between the residents of Sultanpur and the PHED, the Public Health Engineering Department that provides water. Hmm? So when we started work in Sultanpur, they said that, you know, uh, that we have poor water supply from the PHED, they're not accountable, and we figured out that one of the problem was lack of communication or mutual accountability between the residents of Sultanpur and the PHED. So, uh, as part of the action research project that was supported by IDRC Canada, we got uh, we got the residents of community into dialogue uh, with the PHED. So I think that is one way of intervening. So getting uh, peri-urban communities into dialogue with state agencies uh, and getting the state to be more responsive to them. So that is one way to fill in what we call the institutional neglect, the institutional void, and that's something where uh, where academics, NGOs, and CSOs, CSOs you know. Uh, have a role to play. So I think that was one. The other thing is that you know, there is a, so uh, so conceptually, the words governance and government mean two different things. So there is an absence of government maybe in the peri-urban in the sense of a formal, uh, formal regularized state approach to regulating the problems, but there are governance mechanisms there, just that, but they're in the non-statutory sphere. So there are informal mechanisms of resource allocation, resource sharing, and uh, difficult as it may seem, I think those need to be understood before we intervene. Otherwise, we may uh, end up creating redundant governance structures. We may end up creating conflicting situations uh, where with contestation of the same set of natural resources. So what I want to argue is that maybe the mechanisms of resource allocation in the peri-urban need to be better researched and documented. And the other response to Dr. Nartika is that, yes, while the lack of planning is, is an important issue, um, bringing everything under a planned approach will take time. But in the meanwhile, there's a lot of scope to just get peri-urban communities into dialogue with state agencies, uh, build civic engagement, uh, you know, the way, we, the way we use that term, and get them to get state to respond more effectively to, uh, to people who live in such spaces. So uh, on uh, Dr. Divya Gupta's yeah yeah uh, comment. So yes, so talking about uh, you know McLeod Ganj and uh, Bharam Shala. So uh, yeah, that's a different kind of peri-urban. That's not like the Chennai, Hyderabad, Gurgaon kind of peri-urban where there's special economic zones, you know, IT and real estate causing land use change. But uh, you know. In the literature, that kind of a land use change is what we call amenity-led migration. 
So it's a term that we use where the where the where the movement of people for the aesthetic value of the place. Yeah, and that's that was also the case of Mukdesh Ekulkes a many led migration. And for Macrod and Dharamshala, maybe the spiritual value is there because of uh, because of you know being being the, the home of the, his his holiness the Dalai Lama. So a lot of people will go there uh, to see uh, you know for the spiritual value. And yes, I've been there too. And there are hotels and resorts. So it's a similar process to Mukteshwar, where the land use change is driven by the by the aesthetic value or by the spiritual value of the place. Yes. Um, so what can we do now? The thing is that one way to uh, one way uh, to intervene in the peri-urban is to mobilize peri-urban communities. And if you want to work with women, that's also one way. To, so for instance, to uh, to mobilize community into collective groups. Yes, uh, but uh, there's a lot of literature which shows uh, the kind of constraints that women face in being part of collective groups. Yes. Uh, and um, a lot of literature talks about what we call nominal participation. So you may have formal groups, they reserve seats for women, but then they're represented by men or by elderly male relatives. So maybe then the way out is to have all, all women groups, all female groups, yes, uh, and, uh, and mobilize them uh, to look at how they can collectively address the you know the challenges that that are coming forth yeah but of course forestry uh, forest is uh, uh, is an area where gender dimensions are very relevant very pronounced and uh, worth investigating uh, you know uh, um, uh, like you said so i think that was uh, that was what i would like to say to in response to uh, divya's questions uh, but dr manakshi sinha so one of the questions was how are the contexts of gurgaon and mukeshwar different so so they were actually part of two very different research projects. And uh, the only reason I brought them together in this talk was that they were interesting insights on the topic of gender. And that's why I brought them here. But yes, Gurgaon's uh, peri-urban is very different from Mukteshwar's peri-urban. So Gurgaon has a phenomenon of land use change that's been driven mainly by, uh, by real estate, by the outsourcing industry, by uh, proposals to set up uh, special economic zones. And Mukteshwar's uh, say in Mukesh was a different kind of peri-urban. It's mainly about a land use change driven by the aesthetic value of the place. Yes, yeah, so and that's in that and in that sense, there are two different cases. And of course, Mukeshwar was also less socially heterogeneous than the research sites in Gurgaon. Yeah, and the questions. So all this research that I presented was the pre-pandemic research. In fact, most of it has already been published, and I cited them. But yes, uh, as I said, that uh, that the pandemic provides. And new opportunities to unravel how uh, how uh, the gender divides have deepened uh, in very urban spaces. And um, I don't have any direct insights on that yet to formal research, uh, except to say that, for instance, if you look at a place like Gurgaon, uh, these little uh, rural pockets, rural settlements that are still intact within the city are in many ways the backbone of the city in the sense that a lot of the uh, supporting services of uh, of housemates, of um, of drivers, of car cleaners, of security guards come from these little rural settlements. These these, these little pockets of rural settlements uh, located within and adjacent to the within the city and adjacent to high-rise gated communities. Uh, and um, a lot of disruption of economic activity would have happened there. And the second thing is that. Uh, as I said, that uh, uh, peri-urban spaces depend very strongly uh, on their links with the city for uh, supplies uh, of goods, services, for movements of labor, uh, for raw material, for, uh, for markets of agricultural produce. And one of the things uh, worth investigating would have been with the disruption of these rural urban links, how are those uh, livelihoods affected? So a lot of research on the peri-urban talks about the rural urban mobility, talks about the diversity uh, in the means of transport between rural and urban areas, and especially in the first wave of the lockdown, uh, when, uh, when the lockdown was rather abrupt, was sudden and abrupt, uh, with a sudden disruption of mobility, then there, that's one, that's one uh, very uh, important area to investigate how the disruption of the rural urban links um, uh, in the midst of the land lockdown and the pandemic affected peri-urban livelihoods, and then what would be uh, the gendered implications of that? So what I found was that uh, all is that is that there's a gender-based division of labor in the household, which reproduced, which, which, which reproduced itself at the farm, right? So in Mukesh, for instance, women do 
a lot of the uh, on-farm work, yes, but carrying the produce to the market, taking the produce to the market is, is, the, is the prerogative of the man. So there is a, so a gender-based division of labor at the household, which in a way reproduces outside the household and governs you know, the household's external interactions and relations. Yeah, on the, Dr. Julia Mukherjee, yes, so first of all, thanks for the uh, nice words on, uh, on the work, uh, on the papers that you've read. And yes, so wetlands are, uh, wetlands are very urban in many ways, uh, in the sense that uh, I see them as a case of, uh, of a common that defies a clear rural urban classification. So we started thinking of, I mean, we started our work on the commons, for instance, Ostrom and others, looking at commons as very agrarian, commons in very agrarian context. So, you know, irrigation systems, pastures, grazing lands. But the, uh, but the growing nature of the city means that the, the rural and urban boundaries are blurring. And therefore, this kind of a dichotomy of commons is a rural common or an urban common, uh, you know, becomes less relevant. And wetlands uh, are, uh, like I've, I've done some work on the deeper beel, yeah, uh, in, in Guwahati in the Northeast, uh, which has very similar challenges. So uh, the encroachment by uh, encroachment along the beel, the shrinkage of its area, the dumping of waste, so the wetlands are, um, are, to my mind, a very important context to study this kind of peri-urbanity, yeah, to understand how the uh, rural-urban dichotomy uh, in classifying commons is no longer relevant. So uh, I think that is what uh, I would say. But also, I think for those of us who are in academics and who work with students or who supervise master's dissertations, doctoral research, uh, I think there's an opportunity to, uh, you know, to encourage students and scholars to look at to look at questions of gender. Um, but as I said, gender is one axis of social differentiation that intersects with many others. Uh, so I think for those of us in academics, in research, uh, there is an opportunity to, uh, to encourage students and scholars to, you know, to engage with these questions, to look at questions of equity uh, and access and uh, changing and, 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 and the implications of rapid urban expansion for changing differential access to resources among different sections of society. So I think that's what uh, I, would, I, would, I would like to say here, yes. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Rashna, and for your elaborate comments on all uh, the discussions, responses. And I'm just saying, uh, Mr. Samir Unhale is uh, with us. Uh, he is the Joint Commissioner and uh, Directorate of Municipal Administration, uh, Gaubita Moras Group. So it's over to you, Mr. Unhale, for your comments. Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to interact. Uh, looking at the uh, borders of rural and urban, we find three kind of uh, uh, situation that one we face in day-to-day uh, -day functioning. One, of course, are the transitory areas, which are uh, beyond 10,000 population. And as far as the state statute is concerned, uh, they ought to be made into a, a transitory urban area, the Nagar Panchayat. Second, of course, are the urban villages, which in uh, especially more so in the metropolitan regions. Uh, and third, of course, is the peri-urban area, which uh, deals about the administrative borders uh, between the so-called municipal or statutory urban area and the non-urban area, which normally is a rural area. So uh, as was rightly mentioned, uh, there is no uh, vacuum as such in the peri-urban area as far as the governance is concerned, uh, especially in as at, at least in the state of Maharashtra, I can definitely vouch that uh, every uh, habitat which is uh, in the peri-urban area is uh, very much under a rural administration, local body framework. It will be either a gram panchayat, as we call it here in Maharashtra, yes. or a group gram panchayat. And therefore, uh, the peri-urban area is very much uh, within the uh, general uh, rural uh, local body framework uh, of, the, of the state. And therefore, uh, these uh, areas are definitely uh, scattered by, by the government framework, the local government framework. Uh, secondly, I think as far as the access of gender is concerned and the gender vulnerabilities is concerned, in the in these peri urban areas, uh, I, I think it will be a strange, uh, it will be rather a curious mix actually, because uh, traditionally the rural uh, local uh, rural local bodies are much more stronger institutionally, funding wise and manpower wise, 
to deal on the social welfare administration that would include health education and the welfare administration of the of the of the SCST and OBCs and women. So somehow uh, there is a feeling that the uh, primacy of uh, rural uh, local bodies uh, into peri-urban areas normally tends to have a greater uh, or a stronger administration uh, vis-a-vis uh, gender perspectives as compared to urban area which tends to be more engineering centric it is more technology centric uh, and it relies more and more on the uh, private sector uh, really to look for the usual uh, uh, welfare issues like health and education and even uh, to an extent gender for that matter that would be a bit curious mix uh, but uh, uh, the urban areas are yet to take up the in my view uh, many of them are yet to take up institutionally be strong by manpower wise, by processes wise, by funding wise, regarding uh, uh, taking care of the gender sensibilities in the usual governance function uh, functioning, because uh, uh, all said and done, uh, the inevitability of primacy of uh, engineering and technology in cities is there, and that was just a second observation I felt I should be sharing. Uh, third, of course, is the, the peculiarities of uh, women staying in the peri-urban area uh, in a sense that aspirationally aspirationally the woman would be of course looking more and more towards the uh, urban sensibilities culturally as to uh, maybe greater access greater education greater mobility uh, greater uh, assert assertance into the normal social uh, life uh, culturally speaking however the uh, the social norms of a rural area are not entirely like that of uh, maybe a, a big urban area. As was rightly mentioned, I was, of course, probably comparing more with uh, uh, million plus uh, city regions or uh, urban areas like uh, that too in, within Western Maharashtra or uh, Western India for that matter. Uh, so what I'm saying probably may not have uh, much relevance into pan-India level. Uh, however, this, uh, this, uh, this culturally, uh, there is, you know, the, the this tug of war really goes on where the a uh, woman would be fighting a girl child or maybe a college going woman a young adult or someone who is working it making newly into family uh, it goes to this uh, cultural and psychological tug of war between the existing uh, uh, social conditions uh, that exist in a peri urban area and uh, what sometimes she really looks uh, up to and aspires for into uh, what actually goes uh, goes around with her because traveling into a core of a mega city region or a city or a million plus city region is not a problem. Mobility is always there. So probably this uh, tug of war at psychological and cultural level is very much a, a factor actually that needs to be uh, catered for. And uh, fourthly, I would like to uh, just share some views upon the, uh, the governance part, the hardcore administration part uh, that really goes, uh, as was uh, mentioned earlier in one of the webinars of the IMPRI, I think I remember, uh, there was an uh, issue raised regarding uh, the fund, uh, fund flow from the provincial or from the state uh, uh, government and as well as from the central uh, funding mechanisms to the peri-urban area uh, is uh, mostly as the norms of rural. So the funding, I think there is staff for funding uh, in, all, in all the aspects of uh, administration is concerned uh, as compared to the urban area because in fact uh, even in the 15th finance commission we are seeing that the fund flow which is going from for the million plus uh, area goes into the urban uh, the, the lead urban uh, city of that part and uh, that doesn't really that goes mostly to municipal bodies and probably the some something has to be thought you know as uh, an additional uh, funding patterns for uh, the peribran area is also important. And fifthly, of course, I felt that the uh, the we of course it's a very it says I become a cliche now that everything functions in silos, not only within a organization but within the area area also. There's a lot of uh, intersectoral functioning is happening, <clears throat> and uh, maybe two examples uh, that could be shared. Uh, one of uh, so how the rural urban dichotomy needs to be a bit diluted. And probably we could have more flexible and more, you know, matrix form of uh, flexi structures, uh, which could take care of uh, the administrative and governance issues. 
uh, maybe in fact uh, as far as the town planning part is concerned in the state of maharashtra i could share that uh, the urban norms uh, are extended up to 15 kilometers into the peri urban area uh, so whatever uh, regulation uh, development and control regulations are there uh, of uh, urban area they are also extended even to peri urban areas by 15 kilometers that is a general uh, semblance which is being done so the uh, there is no uh, planning vacuum as such uh, as far as the, the peri-urban area is concerned, even development is concerned. Uh, similarly, for uh, infrastructure, providing of infrastructure, maybe water supply, so maybe uh, there have been, in fact, uh, the earlier place which I had worked, if there is just a road across uh, the administrative border and uh, of urban and a rural part, I mean, it was just a road in which the other side of the road was a gram panchayat. It was as uh, neighborly as that. And in this case, you know, it did happen that the uh, usual uh, civic services issues, which otherwise may not be that strongly in other rural part, are quite strong. And therefore, some mechanism has to be developed, you know, and therefore, uh, the act does talk of collaboration between the various local bodies. So the provision is there. There is a provision of cooperation and collaboration between various units of the urban or the rural body. And that can be probably made more stronger uh, one one example we have here is a combined water supply scheme. The regional water supply schemes is uh, is, is a common phenomenon now in many parts. Uh, however, uh, uh, in in fact, in, even in Mumbai region, there is a uh, there is a company actually called as the STEM Authority, which takes care of the water supply scheme of the urban as well as the rural. Uh, very urban area also. So these these are various examples, you know, which could be tried off. And lastly, which was really rightly mentioned, was the solid waste management issue. In fact, wherever I have worked in urban areas, there have been, uh, uh, you know, there has been uh, discord and uh, maybe mild clashes regarding solid waste management, where the uh, where the solid waste of the city is to be put somewhere and normally it lands up into a peri urban area or a village, and that does create a issue and uh, frankly speaking despite uh, many projects uh, this issue has not entirely been solved i haven't seen to be entirely solved there have been you know slight uh, tailoring here and there maybe political uh, discussions compromises maybe certain you know uh, developmental works given as uh, uh, given as incentives to take the uh, take the filth of the city but yes the i think the as far as this uh, providing civic services providing uh, infrastructure services into peripheral barrier uh, probably requires a uh, faster rethinking because you know where the the way cities uh, and the way urban areas respond and the way rural hierarchy as we I mean uh, as we know uh, in India the rural uh, rural local body system especially you know we had the it's almost no it is also 50 70 years old now after the Palavantra Mehta famous Palavantra Mehta committee and the Ashok Mehta committee which dwelt upon the structure of the rural urban local bodies focusing on democratic decentralization and that is almost a uh, lot of time has gone and uh, uh, as, as, as was mentioned probably the dichotomy framework of rural urban needs to be uh, probably uh, made more flexible and greater cooperation within the local body the political structure and as well as the uh, uh, joint uh, bodies or joint companies or joint uh, departments of the peri-urban urban could be tried out because the uh, political significance of peri-urban areas is not uh, you know, very small. In fact, I have seen cities getting uh, expanded once, twice, thrice, four times of the peri-urban area, which getting it's like a black hole sucking you know, more and more matter. So the big city region keeps on sucking more and more uh, peri-urban areas into its administrative framework and ultimately making unwieldy. Uh, to manage, so the lot of you know the such uh, uh, thoughts are being now discussed that uh, where what has is, is there an optimal size of a peri urban area? Uh, Indian context, we really don't have any metropolitan governance framework as of now. We may be having a land use planning or infrastructure providing framework, but a metropolitan governance framework is uh, still absent in Indian context. Maybe uh, the example often comes out of Paris, in which or even London for that matter, where a three-tier system can uh, somewhere be available. So I think there is a lot of scope and a lot of uh, need of collaboration between academic, 
between media, between you know uh, research and administration, uh, really to find out uh, what are the uh, scientific, I mean, to find out scientifically as to what are the ways of, uh, what are the framing the issue itself as well as uh, finding the causes of that. Because uh, mere reliance on so-called experience is often found to be you know not accurate uh, in depiction of the reality. So uh, I think uh, I'm sure uh, other countries, uh, other parts of the world uh, might also be facing uh, a different kind of challenges. When we talk of urbanization, it's essentially now global south. It will be Asia, it will be Africa, it will be Latin America, and uh, what predictions or patterns that we are expecting. I think there will be a lot, of, lot to share, a lot to learn, and maybe some ideas, some framework of you know, institutionalizing this uh, cooperation uh, in an easily accessible way to everybody is also a need of the R, you know, which could be uh, thought of. Uh, so I think, uh, so, sorry, uh, I think I probably exceeded my time limit. So it was, uh, it was great to listen. And thanks a lot for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ronhalle. Uh, yeah, uh, I, it's over to uh, Professor Narayan for the responses. But before that, uh, just I'm seeing another one uh, question in the Q&A box. And uh, it is uh, partly related to the larger issues of governing these petty urban areas, who will govern the petty urban areas. But as uh, second part, uh, I, I think you may uh, like to highlight or you may like to comment, like what is the role of these uh, governing structure in as far as the creation of opportunities are concerned to reduce the kind of gendered inequalities that you talked about in your uh, presentation. So it's over to you, uh, Professor Narayan. Right. Okay. So just some uh, quick, you know, quick responses to uh, to the uh, to the last uh, discussion. So yeah. So as you said, I agree. So it's not that there is a, a governance lacuna in that sense because what you call peri-urban would typically be a village. Uh, you know, uh, at the cusp of a city or being transformed, uh, you know, through the interface with the city, but it will pretty much have its own village panchayat. So all the village, all, all the sites that I spoke about today had functioning uh, village panchayats. But the issue, I think, is about uh, looking at, uh, uh, like the challenge is in looking at issues which, uh, which cut across the rural urban jurisdiction. So for instance, if you think of urban wastewater, you know, coming into the villages and being used for irrigation. Yes, so that's one. Or if you think of the relocation of polluting industries from the city core to the periphery. Yes, so it is not that there is no governance structure in place. So there, there, there will be a village panchayat. Uh, so in Gurgaon, there are many, uh, there, there are many uh, say, rural settlement areas uh, within uh, the jurisdiction of the city that are now officially under the municipal corporation of Gurgaon. So if you, uh, if you, so you will see a board that says village Wazirabad Municipal Corporation of Gurgaon, or you will say village Tigra Municipal Corporation of Gurgaon. But the governance challenge maybe there is that while the, uh, while the older governance structure, like the panchayats has ceased to exist, maybe the new governance structure has not completely uh, taken over or is not completely functional. So I think it is these kinds of issues uh, that we need to address. Um, I think also uh, one area where we need to intervene is how is in our education and training and capacity building. So uh, when we train urban planners, so we have institutes that train urban planners, we have institutes that train rural development professionals. Yes, so maybe I think this overcoming of this rural urban dichotomy needs to start at that stage. So uh, how do we train urban planners that don't look at, uh, that, that don't look at the city uh, outside uh, the rural context. So how do we train urban planners that understand the implications of the urban expansion of the city uh, or that under who understand the implications of the expansion of the city for the rural area? So I think uh, how we, so I think a lot of uh, possibility and opportunities for reform in curriculum when we train what we call urban planners, urban professionals, or when we train rural development specialists uh, to encourage them to look at the relationship between the rural and the urban rather than to position themselves as urban planners or as rural development specialists. So I think that is one. The other thing is also training and capacity building of existing professionals. So getting uh, urban planners, um, uh, training them to look at the peri-urban, to understand the peri-urban issues, to talk about gender, to talk about, uh, to talk about uh, you know, the impacts of urbanization on natural resources. So I think training and capacity building is important. 
And this also relates to a comment that Jenia you know, raised a little while ago, like how should academics interact with other actors? And I think that um, you know, in academics, we concentrate a lot, a lot on scientific publishing, on writing, you know, articles in peer-reviewed journals, which is important for academic uh, credibility and recognition. But also, I think as academics, we need to uh, reach out to different kinds of audiences, also communicate with different kinds of audiences. So, um, and that's where maybe writing policy briefs or writing uh, short opinion pieces in the newspaper that allow us to communicate with a larger group of actors, you know, outside the academic community is important. So doing policy briefs, writing editorial pieces, writing popular articles, these is of course a lot of opportunities on social media. So I think that, so that's, that's an important role to play in terms of creating a public opinion, in terms of informing public opinion, to think about the peri-urban, to think about the peri-urban. I think that is what, that is what I would say. Again, these are not definitive, but these are just some thoughts. <laughs> Well, anyway, thank you. Thank you for sharing all your thoughts. And uh, I am just, just if you, uh, will it be fine if I take one more commentator because I'm seeing Professor Gopal Shamanti is with us. Okay, so, all right. So, so if, uh, if Professor sure, Shamanti, sure, sure. yes, if you want to uh, come in, uh, uh, Professor Shamanta, can you hear us? Uh, So, Unmute. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shomodi, for giving me this opportunity to come in. And uh, it was wonderful to listen to um, Bishal. Actually, I'm very happy to hear uh, Bishal. And I'm sure that Bishal is not um, trying to say that gender is an important factor to consider in, in natural resource management or peri-urban or whatever, because if I can remember correctly, Vishal was here in Bodhaman University, was speaking on water. And that time uh, he was mentioning that even uh, irrigation sector, how, how the prob problem aggravates, like, you know, the probably the entitlement of land was in the, uh, in the name of a man in the uh, family, who is absentee farmer and allocation of timing of in the middle of the night. And the woman in the family, they, uh, she has to go to take the charge of irrigating her field. So uh, I'm so happy that um, now Vishal is expanding um, uh, this work on gender. And, and he is speaking that the people who like us, who are in the field of academia and we have uh, to supervise uh, master's thesis or maybe uh, PhD thesis. So maybe we can look into that how gender, we can accommodate gender in different issues which we are trying to talk about. And uh, so uh, the other day I was just thinking when I was, I, was, uh, I was reading for one reason, I was reading in detail the documentation of um, sustainable development goals. And I was thinking that seven out of 17 goals, one is given for gender equality, you know, just like a seven compartment train and one compartment is dedicated. Because, you know, everything we talk about, even if we talk about climate change, how can we leave gender? So gender is structural inequality. It is everywhere in each sector, in each theme. So as soon as we recognize that, and rather than taking it into the account that like everything is gender neutral, and it's not actually, actually we are gender blind. So we don't see gender as a structural inequality. So it is always good to bring in. And I'm very happy, Vishal, that you, you brought in this idea that even if we are talking about peri-urban, gender needs to be addressed. And I also agree to some extent with uh, Mr. Unahale that yes, sometimes peri-urban also facilitates women. Like I was, uh, I was reading one PhD thesis from South Asian University and that girl has worked on Gurgaon and the gender question. And uh, she is from sociology background and showing that even within Gurgaon, the traditional village feudal structure and how this structure is getting transformed a little bit, which is like a bringing a fresh oxygen for the women in the village. So maybe there are other issues, cultural and social advancement, 
but definitely like Vishal has already pointed out that it's not that comparable that I'm talking about a hill city and peri-urban where the villages are heavily dependent on natural resource collection. So there definitely would be a different story of gender um, question and uh, which might not match with Gurgaon or any other peri-urban location in around Kolkata or Mumbai. But I think it is very important for us that we, we try to look into the gender desegregated database. We try to develop gender desegregated da database and we try to uh, be a uh, look. We better try to look at the gender question with, uh, uh, rather than being just like, you know, gender blind. So it was a wonderful uh, talk. And of course, everybody um, as, and also my feeling is still, as Bishal has pointed out, that always look at, we try to portray that, you know, apathy of, you know, state and planning, etc. But everybody now, nowadays, there is a lot of argument, like, you know, planning and master plan or the plan for a longer period of time is not going to work. Anyway, because situation is changing so fast that mm -hmm. even the time period a planner uh, develop and, and try to accommodate or implement, then the whole lot of things, ground reality changes so fast. So even uh, these days, there are a lot of discussions like Gautam Van is talking about that incremental development, incrementality, informality should be acknowledged. And so... Probably we need a better lens to look into the peri-urban and of course my um, gender is a question and it's it's core to my uh, it's it's very near to my heart so that's why I'm very happy that when when Bishal brings in this idea to the to the front and asks that uh, we should look into gender uh, whenever we are talking about either urban or rural or peri-urban and definitely these these dichotomous uh, division of uh, territory, territorial division, that had changed a lot, I think, over the last couple of decades, because rural areas, you know, socially, culturally, and this kind of cultural globalization kind of things, after that, we cannot probably um, uh, divide that way. And sometimes it is also seen that peri-urban is under the rural governance, which is more beneficial, get more funds for some, something else. So it's probably a nuanced space and where messiness is more than have a very discreet uh, kind of um, implications we see. So that's all. It's not just, just an additional um, comment kind of. It is not a question. I'm very happy to, to hear all of you. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Professor Shamanto. First of all, thank you for uh, joining this uh, City Conversation yeah. Series talk today and sharing your thoughts. And uh, as you have rightly pointed out, like uh, actually the problem with these main course uh, discourses on urban development is that we always try to see the cities as the place of deficits. Like we are thinking about the governance deficit, we are thinking yeah. about their weak financial uh, health and so and so forth. And as uh, in fact, uh, Narayan also mentioned about in his talk that uh, the real uh, one of the real challenges uh, is to how to integrate these informal practices which are there which are pervasive in the uh, these peri urban areas into the formal governance structure uh, uh, wh whatever in, in whatever form uh, they are in the peri urban areas and this could have important gender implications as well so uh, before winding up i think let's uh, again go back to uh, all our discussions because uh, just a quick, uh, maybe a minute or so, if you can share your uh, final thoughts, then we can, we'll go, uh, come back to uh, Dr. Nanan for his final conclusion, include, uh, concluding thoughts. So let's start with, uh, uh, again, the same order, Dr. Nala Thiga. Uh, maybe your thoughts on, uh, uh, just, just uh, maybe in a minute or so. So are you, so, are you, Please unmute. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry. I thanks, thanks for a such a wonderful discussion, uh, which also has given a lot of insights to me. Uh, I just conclude that, like, apart from what I have raised, uh, what also comes to uh, the uh, four is that, like, you know, uh, how do we go about uh, the planning in the peripheral areas, uh, which requires a very, very different approach from what we do in the case of the 
central core cities is coming to the fore. So which requires, as uh, Professor uh, 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 Narayan also outlined, a different kind of skill sets, a different kind of orientation, different kind of approach. And that's where even some of the, uh, the Western thinking is also like uh, more about uh, a collaborative planning approach and uh, more about uh, a participative approach and more about engaging the local uh, communities and understanding the local uh, uh, institutions better and trying to integrate them into the, uh, the, the plans that are going to be developed. So they cannot be using the same apparatus what they use in the case of the mainstream cities. Rather, the approach has to be very, very different. And that, that, that uh, orientation, that skilling has to be done as well in the curriculum, as well as in the way they are trained subsequently also, as he has outlined. That is one thing which comes up. And uh, yeah, that's all I have uh, to say in a minute or so. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nalatika. Now it's over to Dr. Divya. Thanks again. And uh, I cannot thank you all enough for such thought-provoking uh, questions and also uh, Dr. Narayan for so thoughtfully reflecting on them. I particularly wanted to, to acknowledge Dr. Jinya Mukherjee's really enthusiastic and animated comment. I mean, your enthusiasm was contagious. I feel so energized <laughs> um, and, and it, it was fantastic. Uh, what really struck me, I mean, I just wanted to highlight that, you know, Genia, in your comment, what really struck me was this politics of typology, that how, when we use these certain terms like peri-urban or, uh, you know, rural and urban, uh, how that triggers a certain kind of uh, I think perception of a particular context. And then I feel that, you know, that is so important. I mean, it's, it's like the undertone and it's very subtle, but at the same time, it has such an important role in the way we perceive and the way we enter these contexts. So thanks for highlighting that. And another, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, point that I wanted to highlight, which was again, something that uh, Genia shared was, which really struck me was how when we um, think about the context of gender or <clears throat> of vulnerability, we view these, these people as passive audience and passive adapters, but then the reality is something else. I mean, these are the people through whom, you know, they're, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult to, to, to box them, you know, their role really like, you know, uh, understand their role. So that was, again, like, you know, something that struck me. Uh, so, I mean, I just wanted to communicate that there's so much that I've learned through this panel and I'm so grateful that I could attend it. So thanks, thanks everyone. And thanks to Dr. Narayan, especially and, and all the panelists. Thanks, thanks Dr. Divya. Yeah, thank you for your comments. And now it's turn of uh, Trami Nakshi. Uh, hi, again. Uh, I just want to emphasize a few things. One was with Professor Vishal probably already mentioned, and I think somebody else also mentioned in a different way. Uh, we as academicians tend to write papers, which is, I think, a party requirement of our profession. And one thing is the abstract part, the other is the empirical part. And once you go up to reaching communities or different actors, I think what we need to focus, and especially as public policy scholars, where are actually the areas uh, well, like I said, if we could have the right data, if you would know the different dynamics, what are the sort of threads which are uh, sort of work work in one space, whereas uh, which don't work in another space, then we can have a sort of uh, a set of public policy interventions where we can mitigate problems. That's one thing which I wanted to already mention. The other was about the governance. I think a lot of people have raised the issue in different ways in peri-urban areas. And like Professor Vishal rightly mentioned, uh, um, especially in the Indian context, there is no definition as to what is peri-urban. It could be a greater Hyderabad metropolitan region, it could be NCR in Delhi, it could just be a rural uh, urban intersect in, uh, in another part of the country. So, but still, having said that, I think if there is some kind of mapping in terms of research and all of this, uh, what kind of governance or what kind of body is there, for instance, if it's, just, uh, see, if it's not a metropolitan agency, then we do have nowadays, uh, I know in a lot of states, still not formalized district planning committees. 
can we push for those if uh, if they can be effective ways for sort of leveraging certain tools or leveraging sort of uh, empowering these communities can we come up with institutions to, i mean since we're talking about gender health occupational or whatever education whatever can we do can these uh, planning agencies or statutory bodies can they be useful or will we just add to the burden i think these are some of the issues which probably if mapped out can sort of uh, help us really you know like i said where can we public policy as a policy as it can be uh, sort of a partner with policy makers non government organizations academy or as an academy such as yes or with government and help and, and sort of create bridges so that is what i want to conclude with uh, yeah thanks 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 dr minakshi yeah so now uh, yes dr jenia for your yes yes uh, thank you very much i have also learned a lot of course from this lecture and uh, the discussions and i think like one uh, specific point uh, uh, which i would also like to highlight very much you know in uh, uh, lines with the comment made by uh, vishal sir is that you know uh, why it is important for us to also rely upon multimodal dissemination tactics or strategies for that matter so like uh, uh, if we so for example i know i think it's high time for us to really you know uh, come out of our comfort zones and push our frontiers as much as possible so what i'm trying to say is that like if we really want to collaborate with you know other sectors so if there has to be you know this uh, uh, multi stakeholder engagement it's very easy to you know kind of uh, say and very loosely blurt out these terms like multi stakeholders participatory inclusive but how do we go about this we really need a very like uh, very in depth but at the same time robust yet feasible methodological design through which this can occur or happen slowly and steadily and i think sir also mentioned that you know i I, i think that academicians they really have a role you know to reach out to the wider society so i uh, attended like a very interesting workshop i think 3 uh, years back uh, which was uh, conducted by um, rekha ranganathan from iihs indian institute of human settlements uh, bangalore and there she talked about that each and every academician you know when uh, he or she completes one very good piece which for example has been published in uh, environment and urbanization or for that matter any other good journal global environment change but why he or she also needs to communicate a very small piece maybe a opinion piece of the same argument for the wider society you know in any of these uh, like uh, platforms any of these like popular platforms so that the crux of the argument anyone and everyone can actually read because uh, otherwise the, our ngo partners or the grassroots organizations people or the policy makers you know for example urban scholars peri urban scholars uh, in the last two decades i think they have produced like fascinating pieces of work but unfortunately you know uh, we have not been able to communicate our message to the larger so neither the you know uh, majority people for whom we are speaking or you know we are trying to assert uh, our voices for them that is at least what we quote and would claim uh, about but unfortunately we are not being able to either reach them or nor you know our, the policy makers or the bureaucrats are being able to make sense of what we are arguing about so i think it's high time and also for the students so for example like the btech students mtech students coming from different backgrounds computer science naval uh, aeronautics so many other uh, you know uh, uh, different disciplines but how do i make these students understand what is the peri urban and also so many terms like peri urban sub urban rural urban ravi so so how how do i you know how do i really come up with uh, uh, some very significant mechanisms through which you know uh, they can really understand what peri urban is all about so maybe field uh, 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 investigations or field uh, you know uh, exposure visits, visits can be conducted and there can be like sketches photo essays exhibitions visual immersions what not you know if we really uh, want to uh, kind of uh, uh, research not only in uh, the peri urban uh, aspect but several other aspects which uh, otherwise are like you know fascinating concepts which are being discussed up on since the last uh, two to and half year uh, decades but you know but still we really need to consolidate by uh, uh, widely reaching out to all strata all sections all age group uh, of uh, the society at this 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jenia. And then uh, let's uh, go, uh, request uh, uh, Mr. Unale, uh, if, you, if you want to share uh, some final thoughts in a minute. Yeah, it, it, this has been a very interesting uh, discussion all the way. And I think uh, looking at the specific uh, governance intervention on gender vulnerability in peri urban area, if you just a uh, uh, just few words on that, uh, that A, there is the, the way the rural administration uh, looks at gender vulnerability is uh, might be a bit different from what the uh, urban local bodies do, and therefore there might be a gap into this, and some uh, identifying of vulnerabilities for gender needs to be you know brought on same page from both rural and urban as far as peri urban is concerned. Uh, secondly, the, uh, the the manpower deployment, which is normally done within the government, like uh, the manpower that the Jilla Parishad or the uh, rural panchayats have and what the urban local body might be having uh, probably some mechanism of they uh, talking to each other and probably uh, working together is something uh, some uh, flexibility as i said uh, also needs to be tried you know the traditional way of uh, administration is found wanting in many ways and therefore innovation in governance is also an important part uh, generally as well as specifically on gender issues so uh, thank you for that thanks a lot yeah, before uh, just uh, listening to some concluding thoughts of uh, thoughts from Professor Narayan, so let me now request uh, Dr. Arjun Kumar, who is the director of IMPRI. So if he wants to chip in and share uh, your thoughts or comments. Yeah. No, no, sir. We can have concluding remarks from oh. Vishal. Sir. Already okay, it's couple time. Yeah, yeah, couple. Yeah. So it's over to you, uh, uh, Professor Narayan. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So just like everybody else, I also learned a lot uh, uh, in this uh, webinar, and I think it's been one of the most uh, productive uh, and engaging webinars that I've been part of, uh, you know, in the recent uh, in the recent time, especially from the contributions from all the discussions. So, and I, I could identify also very closely with the last round of comments. So one is like, how do we identify the peri-urban? How is it different from the suburban, the urban? So when I have to explain peri-urban to my students, I say that it's what you see when you drive along a highway. So if you, if you drive between one city and the other, so, I mean, pictorially that's peri-urban. And I find that as the, most, uh, as the most effective way to get this message across. Also, I think that for those of us in academics, integrating our research, and for those of us who are working on the peri-urban, so integrating our research with the teaching is a very effective way to, to build a critical mass of interest and research on the peri-urban. So if you bring your own you know, peri-urban paper to the classroom, yeah, and then you have a captive audience of like 30 students, 40 students who suddenly get, uh, you know, uh, get interested in the peri-urban. So I think that's, that's, a one, that's a quick way also of, 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 of creating interest, of creating a body of knowledge on the peri-urban in the long run. And, uh, and Gopa, yes, it was so nice to connect with you after a long time. And yes, as you mentioned that when I came to birth one, I was not working so much on gender and I just had a peripheral interest. And it was only over the years that when I started seeing gender in the field that I started consolidating my ideas. So as I said that, you know, I never started off as a gender researcher. I did not go to the field, you know, investigating gender relations, with specific questions, but it was so basic uh, that it always came up. And over time, I ended up consolidating all my insights on gender and then trying to put them together. But the point that also Gopa was saying about, you know, why one LDG on gender, I think it works both ways. So at the one level, we have to mainstream gender in whatever we're talking about. At the same time, if we just leave it to mainstreaming, it's possible that it gets neglected. Yeah, so then it makes yeah. sense like one separate box on gender so that uh, so that it, it get, it's there, so that you make sure it's there. Yeah, so I think it works both ways. So we, it needs, it's a gender is a cross-cutting issue. It needs to pervade our thinking no matter what. So there's no aspect of our life that is not gendered, right? So it has to be a cross-cutting issue. At the same time, having a separate little box there, make sure that, that, that it, it's not left to chance. So I think it works both ways. So with that, uh, thanks very much. And uh, thanks to Impri so much for a very nice uh, you know, gathering of discussions who could stimulate further reflection and uh, help me consolidate my own thoughts as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Narayan, for your wonderful talk. And this session has indeed been quite engaging. And uh, we are really thankful for you for highlighting this, the importance of this gender lens uh, uh, to understand the vulnerability of the peri-urban areas and also as 
uh, Dr. Divya mentioned, this discussion is being uh, truly contagious because it encourages us to deep dive sort of uh, into all these similar sorts of research issues. So uh, once again, uh, from the team IMPRI, we are thankful to Professor Vishal Narayan. We are thankful to all our panelists, Dr. Ramkrishnan Lathika, uh, Dr. Minakshi Shina, uh, Dr. Divya Gupta, Dr. Ajenia Mukherjee, uh, Mr. Samir Unhale, and also we are thankful to Professor Gopal Shamanto for uh, uh, joining this uh, session. So uh, we are also hopeful that we will be able to have you in our future city conversation series as well. So with this, uh, uh, so thank you, thank you from once again from Team Impri and uh, yeah, it's uh, stay safe and take care all. Yeah, it's good night. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yes.